we should give a shout out to Milton and VC here for this amazing conference. What do you guys think? Huh? Thank you so much. This is amazing, as always. So yeah, I'm Siggy Marmerstein. I'm a, a nurse practitioner in my profession, and I'm a telehealth consultant. I have uh, the CEO of Telehealth Consulting Services, and have helped about many, many <laughs> telehealth programs to get started, uh, about 60 of them at this point, um, through some uh, USC, um, recently at the Vida and uh, Kaiser Southern California and others. And I want to say that one thing that I'm hearing over and over here is the problem that we have with telemedicine around uh, physicians want to participate in telemedicine. Um, and of course, a lot of that does not have to do just with the physicians, have to do with the way we pay physicians, which is our reimbursement models are a little bit broken, broken right now. That we burn them out and we pay them less, and so they don't want to do any more. Um, but uh, you know, another thing that I'm hearing over all the time is the lack of support from leadership. Uh, we hear about the no gap analysis, and that's something that I see all the time when I'm consulting others, is that they don't know what the focus is of the telemedicine program. They're not sure why they're doing it. Um, they're not sure who is the team members who should be doing it. Um, they don't know if they want to do population health, if they want to do urgent care, if they want to do emergency medicine. So when, usually when I come on board, they say, we want to do telemedicine. Our physicians don't want anything to do with it. Our C-suit want nothing to do with it. And we're not really sure why we want to do it, but we know we should do it because we want to have a competitive edge. And I always say, well, <laughs> uh, let's start there. So I'm going to talk today about um, how you can utilize other team members in doing telehealth. And one of the team members that seems to be doing the most of it, actually, is nurses and mid-level providers. Now, not to say that these are the only people who are doing it, but we are definitely the people to think about um, as we're looking at the different kind of modalities of telehealth. So a lot of you think of telehealth as video conferencing. And so we think video, video, let's do video. Well, there's a lot of other ways to do telehealth. And I have, I can tell you, as somebody who started many programs, I can only say that out of our 60 programs that I have started, only about 50% of them actually were video component telehealth programs. And they still were very, very successful. So think about the different modality. Video conferencing is a little bit the most, probably the most complex and the most expensive telemedicine modality that we can start in a, in a healthcare system. Um, the store and forward, which is the texting uh, or using text as a modality for delivering care, is actually a preferable uh, by, by the patients. Uh, patients enjoy texting, um, and if you do have young patients, they like it even more. I know my son can text about 200 words a second um, and can do about 3,000 videos on Snapchat before I even open my eyes in the morning. And these are the generation who has coming into medicine. So a lot of us here in the room are thinking about our elderly patients or our population health or other patients. But think about who is coming into medicine and who are we serving? What do they like? Well, they don't like to show themselves on videos, actually. They really do like texting. And so think about that as another modality. Remote devices, we talked about a lot in here, but I want to talk about the phone. So when I was at Kaiser, our first attempt in telehealth was actually what we call the care phone model. Um, and that was actually a very good way to find out about a lot of different um, you know, projects or workflows around telehealth without actually having to expand the telehealth program. So the care phone model, and those, is anybody here from Kaiser? Because if you are, you know about it. Kaiser offer 50% of their schedules as a phone appointment. So um, as a physician at Kaiser, um, their revenue, you're an employee, so it, all of that is great. So maybe you will be doing about, you know, 40% of your schedule or 50% of your schedule will be face-to-face -face visits in the clinic, and the rest of it may be a phone or a video visit. Um, how did we get to that is pretty much um, you know, making the follow-up appointments for a patient on hypertension, labs, or all of the minor stuff to be on a phone. Um, and we started off by having it done by the nurses or the nurse practitioner or the mid-level providers for hypertension, chronic healthcare manager, patients who just started on new medication, whether it was for, um, you know, new, new medication for diabetes or anything like that. Their um, phone appointments uh, were the follow-up. After that, 
we expanded urgent care services into the phone. And so this is called KP Now model, and the KP Now model means that if you are a Kaiser member, when you call the call center, um, you will be offered a phone appointment within 30 minutes. And one of our physicians will be calling you um, if you feel that you have, well, oh God, the time flies here. Okay, so we'll move fast. So these are the kind of stuff that we were treated over the phone. Uh, you can still treat over video. You not necessarily have to have an eye on a patient, right, for any one of those things. Um, you know, uh, but if you do need to, you can ask the patient to quickly take a picture and text it over. And so that's something that we have done quite a bit. And um, this works very, very well. And guess what? You don't need a physician to do any of this. This can be done very well by a nurse practitioner uh, or a mid-level provider. And you know, then they will probably will be well within the scope of practice to do this. A little bit about statistics about NPs, a lot of things people <laughs> don't realize. We actually, between our ends and nurse practitioner, we are the largest workforce in healthcare. That means that when you're trying to hire a nurse, a physician to your telehealth practice, you know, you may want to think about maybe also hiring an NP into that practice. This is some great statistics for you. One of the big ones is that maybe people don't realize this. We don't get sued as much as physicians do. So we are less of a liability <laughs> as physicians are. Um, so one of the things that have happened recently, and I don't know if a lot of people are aware of it, but nurse practitioners and nurses are now can work across state line. We have the compact license. And this is a really, really great and wonderful component of anybody who's looking at a telehealth program to understand. If you need a nurse, or if your program can be run with a nurse, she can probably go into 26 states from one license if she is in a compact place, which is not in California, but we're working on that. But if I'm, um, if I'm a Texas-born RN and I uh, go to my board for $70, I will get licensed in all those blue states. Um, and I will be licensed in all of them all at once. And every two years, I will go back to my board and I will be able to um, renew my license. What does that mean for nurse practitioners is that if they are licensed under the compact, they can call the other boards and just pay extra money and get certified in another state to provide services. Something to think about as you're looking at your developing of your program, whether it's for employee health or for any other reason, if you want to work across state line, this is maybe one of the solutions for the problem with states. This is the full practice authority states. The, 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 what you see in here is the green states are allowing nurse practitioners to work independent from physicians. That means that they can open their own practices, they can um, you know, do their own work, and they don't have to have a physician supervision to do so. What does that mean for you as a provider or as a healthcare um, um, you know, or hospitals is that if you're one of those nurse practitioners, you don't have to have physician supervision on them. For whatever reason, you need an NP in your practice. Think about those states as the states that can allow you that. The red states, again, California. We need to go up to the house and make some noise there. California is a red state. That means that I have to be in a collaborative practice with my physician colleagues. I still work in the emergency room on weekends and holidays and whenever I can because I'm an emergency room nurse practitioner for 20 years. And my collaborative practice asks that my supervising physician will not see my patients because they don't, but they have to review at least 10% of my charts once a year. It's not a hard thing to do, but it's something that they have to do. And so we have them co-sign our charts just to be on the safe side of things. So, so why do that? So well, anyways, um, as I said, the top 20 diagnoses that usually are being cared by, um, you know, by physicians can be probably handled by a mid-level provider. They are the largest provider group, so it's easy to hire them. Um, credentialing of a nurse practitioner um, or of an RN are easier than the credentialing of a physician. We can work across state lines. Um, in average, in many, many studies, an RN or an NP can see about three times more patients than a physician can. Um, why is that? It's not because we're so wonderful and great. It's because we're just very effective in the way we manage patients. That's how we're being trained. Um, if you are an RN on a med search floor, you probably will have about 12 patients that you're managing all at the same time. You just kind of learn to do that. Um, patients love us. Uh, satisfaction rate with nurse practitioner on all of the telehealth programs that I have can tell you that I started with was at the 98%. 
We never got sued on any of them. I can tell you right now, I'm talking about nine years and 60 telehealth programs. There was no lawsuits against any of the RNs or NPs who were involved in them. And we just uh, love what we do. Now, another thing with reimbursement quickly, because we don't get reimbursed very well for physician, an RN or an NP can be paid by the hour. And then you're just done. You can pay them for the program and they can see your patients. Marathon, but good, I did it. So um, if you have any questions for me or if you ever need anything from me, please find me. Um, thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Susan. Uh, uh, do have some time for the questions? Yeah. Uh, so in my company, we have 12 uh, mid-level uh, that work for us. Perfect. So if they're in California, are they under, can they apply for a compact and s actually start interacting with patients in Washington, Oregon, or they have to start out in the green state first? No, well, the, there's two different stories here. So the California is just, you know, there's an independency of versus independency of, of just practice. Mm -hmm. But California is not part of the compact set. So if you license, if your original license is from California, you cannot join the compact. What you can do then is go and f um, apply for your RN license in a different state. Mm -hmm. And if that's a compact state, then you'll be compacted out as an R in under your RN license. Um, yeah. Okay, so then you end up having California and another Then you have California state. and it. the rest of the Got states, it. right, Thanks. exactly, right. But it's not one license. Mm -hmm. We're working on that. Um, do you have a special preference about acute care R, uh, NPs? Because NPs now specialize also. So which type of NPs have you found most useful in the telemedicine type of programs? Well, I think it depends on what program you're talking about. So um, I, I'll talk about Mercy Hospital, for example. We did a tele-ICU program that was very much RN-based. The RNs were the first one to start looking at the patient, realizing if it's a septic situation, and go on from there. So um, the, um, in a tele-stroke program, you know, nurse, nurses by the bedside can actually, you know, be the one to be the uh, presenter. I think that it really depends on the practice and what you're looking to achieve within your telehealth. But I can say that using them um, as first line of defense as a way is really probably a very smart and a cost-effective way of getting your program done. We have time for one last question. Any other questions? Well, you guys know where to uh, find me. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was trying to ask something, sir. Like telehealth, you probably know it's actually really difficult to do. <laughs> So one of the things I learned a lot from Sika, I recommend so if you think about telehealth, the part of the best thing you could do is just give her a call, learn from her, maybe hire her as a consult, whatever, just get her inside. That's gonna save you tons of hassle and headache. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.